Hello. Whoa. Hello. I got your attention. Right. Great. Um, cool. Well, we're eight minutes behind schedule, so as I start in the next two minutes, we should be fine. Um, you can't see any of these slides, I guess, so I'm going to do my absolute best to narrate them amusingly. Some of them hopefully have video which will have loud bassy sound, so you'll be able to hear that and just imagine the rest of it. Um, right, cool. So, hi everyone, thank you for coming to this talk. I'm broadly talking about high altitude balloons. Um, there's this really beautiful photo on the screen that we took from one of our high altitude balloons. It's about 35 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and you can see this curvature, it's really pretty. There's the gentle transition from the Earth, this thick blue atmosphere, out to the black of space. And by the edge of a photo, it's just black, and that's space. And this is this classic photo that we get on most of our flights, and you, you really can't see any of it. So just close your eyes and dream of NASA satellite photos of Earth, and you'll get the gist. OK, great. So outline of this talk for some handy bullet points. Um, I'm going to start off with some stuff that isn't high altitude ballooning, but is fast exciting rockets that are almost as high altitude, because that gets the best videos. And then dig into the high altitude ballooning itself. There's a brief overview, what is high altitude ballooning, and why do we do it, and how does it work? And then a little bit of chat about the electronics we build and these payload systems we've made. Some talk about the software systems. We've got this really great community where lots of people can get involved and feel like they're actively participating while sitting at home in their ham radio shack, so that's exciting. Then a kind of history trip through some exciting launches we've had in the past and more recently. And my guesses at the future. I actually gave this talk two years ago at the last EMF and had this great slide of things that might happen in the next two years, and they all happened. So I've got some new ideas this time, and we'll see how that goes. And then some quick details on how you can get involved yourself. And finally, details of the high altitude balloon launch we'll be doing at EMF, hopefully. Um, OK, this is the slide with a photo of me and some details. I'm Adam Gregg. I'm an engineering student. And for the last few years, I've been a member of Cambridge University Space Flight, which is a student society. We do high altitude balloons and rockets and other things that kind of excite us. And I'm also nominally a member of something called the UK High Altitude Society, which is a very loose collective of people who are interested in these ballooning stuff and kind of come together to work on, I don't know, interesting balloon stuff. Yeah. Um, OK, on with the, the videos. I don't know if this is going to play or what, because I exported it from PowerPoint in the car on the way here. Give me a sec. There's no sound, and you can't see the video, so <laughs> just skip right past this. Um, never mind. High altitude ballooning. OK, there's another beautiful photo. You can, oh, I can just see the outline of the Earth there, but you probably can't. Um, on to the overview. High altitude balloons are these really big balloons, usually made of latex, although some people have been experimenting with different materials more recently. And they're actually manufactured for meteorological radio sonde balloons. These are the things the Met Office launches twice a day from 10 places across the country. And they go up, and they pop, and they come down. And the Met Office looks at where they went on the way up to work out where the winds are blowing, and therefore predicts the weather. We fill them with helium, or sometimes hydrogen, which is more flammable but cheaper, and attach our own payloads to them. And usually the payloads are doing a similar kind of thing to these Met Office balloons. They have a GPS unit on them, and most GPSs will work just fine at that kind of altitude. They get their position and relay it down over a radio. And there are a few options for the radio system. I'll talk about those in a bit. Then on the ground, you receive where your payload is, hopefully figure out where it's going to come down, and go pick it up. Maybe you've put some cameras on the payload. You get your beautiful photos. Um, <laughs> it's really the high altitude ballooning thing in a nutshell. A lot of people are into it because they like the photos. Some people like making the custom electronics. There's a lot of scope for doing interesting, exciting things on the electronics. Um, and then, right, the things are coming down off the radio. Someone's got to receive these signals. Usually, you receive the radio signals yourself. But because the protocol is open, anyone across the country or across the world can pick them up if they've got a good radio and an antenna. And people do. So we've built this whole system where anyone who wants to can download the software, listen to these, radio, listen to these balloons, and uh, report back on where they are. And uh, there's some great slides with photos of that too. But, hey. So um, 
Ah, this is where having my speaker notes on the screen would have been fantastic. We, I guess I'll talk about the electronics first. A classic kind of payload is an Arduino, a GPS unit that spits GPS data out over a serial. If you've ever used the GPS, you know exactly what that looks like, and formats the message slightly, sends it back over the radio. Radio modules vary. You can buy a thing off the shelf that you stick into your Arduino, and it needs nothing else. You just chat to it by toggling the pin high and low, and your job is done, all the way through to building the radio entirely yourself from scratch with PLL since it's a huge faff and does not work the first time. And uh, on the screen are some pretty photos of various electronics people have made. OK. Um, the radio telemetry. For people who know about radio, we use usually something called RTTY, which is where you have these two frequencies. It's a kind of frequency modulation. And use it to send binary data. So if you're at one frequency, that's a 0. And at the other frequency, that's a 1. And you just send out serial data. If it sounds kind of primitive, it is. It predates pretty much every other form of technology. This is the stuff people used to have with the actual mechanical teletype printers over the radio. But it works well enough for us. Um, how well is well enough? So these payloads are transmitting with 10 milliwatts of power, which is about as much as your car key fob to unlock your car. The balloons are something like 30 kilometers up and, say, 500 kilometers away from you. And we still get telemetry just great. So it's like five or 600 kilometers distance, same power as your car key fob, and you pick up this telemetry. The secret is it's really, really slow. It's like 50 board data. So you're staring there, and you can see each character come in slower than you could type it. It's awful. Um, on the screen now is a map of a system we've built. I, I, I can see it, kind of. There's a map of the UK, and you can see these little radio masts where everyone who's running the software we've written ha has shown where they are, and they're picking up signals from these balloons. Yeah, cool. Let's move on to the more interesting parts, because you really can't see much of these slides. Um, we launched a cuddly dinosaur into space. There's a photo of a cuddly dinosaur in space. We launched some teddy bears into space. Um, this was quite good fun. We went to a local primary school, had a big outreach event, got two different classes of kids to build spacesuits for their teddy bears so they could keep them warm up in space. The kids got to learn about insulation and building stuff, and they got to be a bit crafty. They stuck some names on the teddy bears, some little flags. They look really sweet, right? Um, you probably... I don't know, can anyone see anything on the screen? I mean... Oh, really? I... Great. Um, I'm loath to touch it, it's kind of big and heavy. Anyway, yeah, there are these teddy bears, and we put thermos, thermos couples, temperature sensors, deep inside the teddy bears and sent them on up into space. And the kids are all excited, waiting to see how warm the teddy bears stay. And, you know, at ground, they're maybe 12, 13 degrees C, a healthy body temperature for a teddy bear. By the time they got into space, they were down at minus 40, so um, they didn't survive that trip. <laughs> but it's okay, the kids learnt a lot. Um, there's a photo of some really rusty electronics now. Often you don't get these things back, especially in the early days of the hobby, back when people didn't really know what they were doing and we had much less sophisticated tools for predicting where the balloon would go. Um, it was kind of a potluck. You launch your thing and it comes down somewhere and you really hope for the best it's somewhere easy to get to. In this case, it landed in the North Sea and we thought that was the end of it. Till four months later, it's washed up on the coast somewhere, covered in rust. Someone's found it walking their dog on the beach, Give, gave us a phone call, and um, pulled the SD card out. Everything was beautiful. Still got the photos, no trouble. Um, yeah, cool. Um, more exciting than just sending up cameras and getting photos, one of the projects Cambridge University Space Flight did with these hardship balloons was a collaboration with the European Space Agency. So if you're a space agency and you're looking to land things on Mars, which you do because Mars is great, uh, you need parachutes for the very, very scary couple of minutes between orbit and on the ground. And if your parachutes don't work, you will be on the ground in more pieces than one and you'll be, have a sad day. So you need to do these parachutes right. Problem is, in Mars, the atmosphere is really thin. You're deorbiting, so you're going to be supersonic. Supersonic parachutes are a whole load of black magic. If you want to test your parachutes in the right conditions, you even need a huge wind tunnel, of which there is one in the world, and it is very expensive. Or you try and be a bit cleverer, which is what we tried to do here. So the theory is, Martian atmosphere is quite thin, and Earth atmosphere is quite thin at 20 kilometers altitude. 
So you take your parachute up to 25 kilometers or so and release it, let it fall down until it's hit its terminal velocity, which in this case is supersonic, and then really, really hope the parachute deploys, because otherwise whoever's underneath this 12 kilogram supersonic lump of fiberglass and metal is going to have such a bad day. Um, this will go straight through an engine block. So like the level of very, very careful planning you go to to make sure this thing has like, it splits into three parts. Each part has two different parachutes. Each parachute has two different pieces of electronics which can fire the parachute. So we're really, really sure the parachutes will work. So yeah, we take this thing up to 25 kilometers, let it go. It accelerates until it's going really fast. Parachute comes out, we collect loads of great, da great data. The European Space Agency gives us tons of money. Everyone is very happy. Um, there's some pretty diagrams we made on how it would work, but you can't see them. There's a great video where we paid someone to take this up in a helicopter to test it at a low-ish altitude just to make sure the parachute's deployed. Um, but you don't have sound or video. So if you imagine a helicopter kind of hovering, I don't know, 100 meters above the ground, and suddenly this quite large orange fiberglass contraption, it looks a lot like a missile, quite bul bulky, but it's pointing down, which is the wrong way. And um, suddenly it drops. It starts falling. There's an intake of breath from whoever's holding the camera. Beautiful parachute unfolds, and someone goes, yes! And um, then it hits the ground gently. So that's that video. There are some still photos of it that you also... Can you, can you maybe see a kind of missile-shaped orange blur? And yeah, this is it under the parachute. It, it's great. Um, OK, and then we eventually did the real test in space. And there's this other great video of this parachute being deployed in space. And Cool. Um, never mind. We sent an Android phone into space. A lot of people have been playing with easier electronics. If you don't really feel like programming your own thing or soldering up an Arduino, there are apps, or you can write an app for your phone. Phones have a GPS, phones have cameras, phones even have their own radios built in, so it can just text you where it is. Um, it works quite well. That was fun. Uh, more recently, people have been doing some more exciting things. Um, traditionally, we sent positions back down over the radio, and you had to go and find your payload and really hope it survived and so forth to get the, mem the uh, photos off the memory card. So obviously, why not send the photos down over the radio? Sounds great, but at 300 board, it's still several minutes for a tiny, tiny thumbnail. People have been working on this slowly, and we're now at the point where you get kind of good images. There's like, I don't know, I should take this to the glitch art tent, really, because this is all the photos of space corrupted by radio noise. Um, you, yeah, it's a, another beautiful photo of the Earth's atmosphere and the gentle curvature of the Earth against the backdrop of space. This one transmitted live from one of these high altitude balloons. Um, and then finally, the other really obvious thing to talk about in terms of exciting hab flights. Um, sometime between last EMF and this EMF, someone called Leo Bodner decided, oh, this looks like a fun hobby. And um, in the last, I don't know, year, has launched something like 70 balloons. So he's refined this payload thing down to a fine art. I mean, 70 is a lot, a lot of these balloons. Um, you probably can't see it here, but it looks like a really cool tiny satellite. It's got little solar panels. It's about the size of a stick of gum. It weighs 11 grams. And um, it goes up on a balloon. His very first flight kind of launched from wherever he lives and came down a few miles away. And it was, by all accounts, fairly pedestrian. The next flight drifted out into the North Sea, which is not uncommon. The next flight hit France, which happens on a very rare day. Um, maybe people started to pay attention. The next flight went even further into the North Sea. We're now up to flight 10, and it's drifted over France, into Germany, up, down past Lithuania, almost hit Ukraine, and landed in Turkey, which is a bit more exciting. He continued flying, launching a couple every day for a long while. This one goes into Germany, up past, uh, I don't know, parts of Scandinavia, and ends up landing in Ukraine. The next one goes even further, past Finland, and lands in Russia. We're up to flight number 40, and it's gone past the Arctic Circle. Flight 44 lands in Syria. 45, and you're really starting to see what he's going for here, drifts all the way past North Africa and ends up landing at the corner of this map that maybe you can see um, kind of south of Russia, past Afghanistan. Flight 47, and last heard from just over Japan. At this point, no one really knows where it landed, but it probably had a sad time in the sea. Flight 52, and um, we've done a big circle all around southern Europe, past Turkey, and back again into the Ukraine, at which point people are starting to think, what is his secret? 
And it turns out the secret in this case is trying 40, like 52 times. It works great. It turns out you can get this thing down to a fine art. These payloads are every bit as perfect and precise as they need to be. They weigh as little as possible. The solar panels mean they can run for as long as they need to go on. And um, the balloons start getting more and more special. Now we're on to flight. Oh, well, yeah, OK, kind of spoilers. Um, there's been a thing running for a few years where people are like, what would be really great, really, really great, is if you could get a balloon all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, because it's a really long distance, and transatlantic has always been this big thing in aviation. Everyone's always wanted to go transatlantic. And for a long time, people would try and would try, and they'd come up with such fantastically complicated systems. You had these balloons with loads of mechanical contraptions and valves and satellite modems and all sorts. And they kept not working, and it kept being very upsetting. Really difficult from the UK because the jet stream always blows you east instead of west. So you pretty much have to launch from America, America or get really lucky. And that was the status quo until some group in California launched a bog standard balloon and by freak chance it went all the way into Mediterranean. And everyone was like, well, let's forget about that. Um, so everyone was kind of hoping maybe one of these balloons would float across the Atlantic. And eventually one did, the long way. So. In fact, this balloon was launched, went all the way out over Russia, over Alaska, all across continental America, then did the transatlantic before finally coming back to where it was launched from and has since done the same thing again. So it's now circumnavigated the globe twice. Did so over like 30 days, and obviously he's not going to stand still and not launch anything for 30 days. So a day after this one goes up, another one is launched. And it's done the same thing, except this one has decided one circumnavigation is great, but what would be really fun is skipping directly across the North Pole. So in fact, comes within 10 kilometers of the North Pole going straight up and down the other side of the Earth. Um, and there's a, there's a top-down view that you probably can't really make out, but it is in fact going all the way around, which is great. And then there was a third one, of course, and the third one has also gone around the Earth twice. So he's kind of blown all the records out of the water. These things are still in the air. They're still transmitting. Um, maybe one will drift over EMF while we're here. In any event, they keep going around. When they come over, you can pick them up and listen to them, and they drift on their merry way. I think it's like 35, 40 days of continuous flight now, um, which is crazy. And uh, there's no end in sight. So those have been some very exciting launches. Um, there's another map of all of them. Cool. So last time I said, oh, what might happen? What are people going to do in the future? What are interesting directions to go in? And there were things like maybe people should start using these radios for stuff like actual photos. And people have done that, which is great. And there was this idea of these Pico launchers, where instead of taking a huge latex balloon, you take a very small kind of foil balloon or plastic balloon. And people have been doing loads of that. In fact, all of these long duration floats have been these special balloons. He makes them by hand now. They're made out of the same plastic that you get in microwave food containers, the kind of peel back stuff. It turns out that works really a treat for these balloons. Um, long duration floats. And then finally, I was like, oh, yeah, maybe someone will finally do the transatlantic. And that's happened. So exciting things to play with in the future now, especially if you wanted to get into things and kind of push the boundary a little. Um, there are these new radios, the LoRa radios, which have built-in error correction. They're actually really fast. They are very spread spectrum. They'll probably work a lot better than everything we've used so far. Plus, they're about five pounds on eBay, which is a quarter of the price. And you don't need an expensive amateur rig to receive them. So probably that will become really popular. Um, TurboHab, which is... Matt, in the corner over here, invented um, the same radios as before, but with actual error correction. And it's kind of nice and binary and efficient. And if you're an engineer, it kind of pleases you, because the old format was about as inefficient as you could get if you tried. And the new format is about as efficient as you can get if you tried. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, Pi in the Sky is this new project. You've probably all heard of a Raspberry Pi, which is this small, cheap computer. Pi in the Sky is a thing that sticks onto it and turns it into a hab payload. So now all you need to do is buy the thing and stick it on, and you have a computer on a balloon, and you can do clever things with that computer, maybe. And then finally, there's this new networking idea coming about, which we're playing with a TMF, in fact, called UK Has Net, which is where we say, instead of all this people manually tuning radios and pointing them at balloons and trying to get data down, wouldn't it be great if it was all automatic? You have a thing in your garden, and it can chat to other things all over your house and people nearby. And if a balloon comes overhead, it just chats to it automatically, and they relay messages. And maybe the balloon lets your house network connect with your friend's house network on the other side of the country. And all the while, it's connected to the internet, and everyone can see where all the balloons are. And it's starting to happen, and it looks like it will actually work, which is really cool. So um, 
yeah, people are playing with those radios here at EMF. Someone elsewhere in England might be trying to launch a balloon to go over us and see if the whole talking to everything automatically will work, which will be great. Um, great, so the getting involved slide. If you too want your own pretty photos of Earth that you can't see on this projector, but I assure you are beautiful, um, it's very easy to get involved. There's a friendly UK, has, UK High Altitude Society. There's a great IRC channel called Hash High Altitude on Freenode. There's a website which has everything you need to know and is ukhas.org.uk. Um, and it's on the screen, but you can't see it. Um, so yeah, and there's a great wiki. It's got loads of examples. It's good fun. Um, more excitingly, launching from EMF. Um, time is to be confirmed because I only arrived half an hour ago. Location is Habville, which I don't know where that is because I have come straight to this tent. Right down the far corner, apparently. Is it near A2? Uh, yeah. It's near A2. Um, and so this time two years ago, we did the same thing. We had this 100 gram latex balloon. We bought two of them at the time. It's about this big. It doesn't weigh very much. You fill it with helium. And we attached a payload called Joey, which was this fun little experimental thing we'd just made. And uh, we let go. We duct taped it into a jiffy bag with our address written on it and a stamp. And we said, if found, please return, because we figured we're not going to go out chasing it now. And up it went. And we all had some fun, and we tracked it. And then somehow, the duct tape failed. The payload fell out of the jiffy bag and hit something like 60 meters a second, which is uh, 150 miles an hour going down, and then crash landed in central London. So <laughs> as successful flights go, this wasn't the best. Um, we got a lot of really angry emails. My favorite was the one calling out for me to be banned from all future uses of a distributed tracking system, which I felt it was a bit harsh given as I wrote half of it. Um, anyway, we're doing exactly the same thing this time. We've got, <laughs> we've got a new batch of Joey's. None of them have been made since the catastrophe two years ago, but I found the PCBs, so we soldered up six more. We've got the twin 100 gram balloon. It's the same one as the two we bought two years ago, and it's been kept in a bag ever since. It's probably fine. And um, yeah, twice as much duct tape is pretty much the plan. Maybe we'll put a little parachute on it, but I don't know if we have any parachute. There are no parachutes, so twice as much duct tape. Um, there's, there's one tool I should mention, which is this predictor we have, and it uses this high altitude wind data to predict where your balloon will go. And it's great. If you know some properties, like it will burst at this altitude, then you know where it will come down, and you can avoid central London, you can avoid airports, you can avoid military bases, you can avoid all these things we've hit in the past and had really awkward phone calls about. Um, and we used the predictor two years ago, and it said, yeah, it'll be fine. And then the balloon kept on going twice as high as we expected, and hence central London. Uh, so this time, we d don't know, really. It will probably be good fun. So we'll probably put it on the schedule. We'll send out an email to the schedule people, I suppose. Come along to a hub village. We'll launch this balloon. It will be quite fun going up. It looks quite cool. We'll track it on our radios, and we'll see where it is. And we'll cross our fingers that it lands in a field. And um, yeah, great. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's it. And uh, we have time for questions. If anyone has questions. Yeah, OK, people have questions. Great. Yep. Sorry. Oh, we have a microphone for people with questions. That's great. Um. Can you put up uh, the slides on the schedule for the talk so we can look at them offline? Yes, good idea. I'll put the slides up. Yeah. And then you can see the pretty photos yourself. That'll be great. OK. And when is the balloon coming? going up? I don't know when. OK. I'll we'll put that on the schedule. OK. Pro do, do, have there any ideas when? It's looking like Sunday, apparently. So how much does it cost to, say, set up your own rig to be launching your own balloons? Um, but what's the sort of entry level for this? Um, like a couple hundred pounds gets you everything you need to get a balloon in the air and track it and so forth. Um, possibly cheaper these days if you go for the much smaller balloons and very small payloads. But like, you'd be safe within a few hundred pounds. And that includes like cameras and helium and so forth. I'm just curious, what's the... Uh do you have to seek permission, like the flying thing? 
Yeah, I should probably mention that. Um, so, <laughs> there's, um, the permission is that it's twofold. You, if you want to launch a big balloon, you have to ask for CAA, and they take a little bit of chasing, and it's usually about a month, and you can say, we'd like to launch uh, this day and maybe this day, and they say, okay, but as long as it doesn't go too near this airport. And you have to get the permission back before you launch, otherwise it is illegal and you're a bad person. If your balloon is quite small, less than two meters in total, enclosing diameter for the duration of a the flight, then you don't need any permission at all and you can just let it go, which is what we'll be doing with these balloons because it's much easier. However, we have in fact secured permission for a large balloon from this site over the weekend, um, but I don't know if we have any large balloons to launch. Oh, we do. So we might be launching some large balloons as well. There's one other detail, which is if you're a hobbyist and you just want to launch a balloon and you don't want to try and get your own permission, there are two sites around the country, both in Cambridgeshire, where we have this kind of rolling 24-7 permission all year long. So if people want to rock up, we can usually arrange to let them launch their balloon without needing to get permission. Cool. Uh, what does the guy who did the, um, uh, what's it called, the, the 70 launches, what did he use for tracking? So he used a combination of things that got cleverer and cleverer as time goes by. Primarily, there's the built-in system which we use over the UK, and that works great in the UK. And there are more and more people running that software in Europe and a couple in America, and it works quite well. But for most of the world, people aren't going to be running the software or listening up your balloon. So there's a different thing called APRS, the Amateur Packet Radio System, which if you're an amateur radio operator, you'll know all about. And um, you can't use it in the UK. It would be illegal because we're not allowed to use our amateur radio licenses airborne. But if you're outside of the UK and you don't look too closely at the fine print on the reciprocal license, you can probably maybe use your license airborne. And so he's been doing that. And occasionally, irate hams whine at him on Twitter and he ignores them. So, I mean, like, there are ways around it. You can get, say, I have an extra American license now because I'm launching a rocket with a radio in America. And then I can use that anywhere that's not the UK. And that also lets me operate airborne, probably. But um, yeah, APRS works really well for this kind of thing, if you're allowed to use it. So the balloons which have been sort of gone all the way around the Earth, yep. how long will it take them to just deflate entirely? It's a really good question, and no one's quite sure. Um, the theoretical rate at which they're leaking helium is really low, because this plastic film is very impermeable. And so far, they haven't changed altitude, which you'd expect them to do if they were leaking helium. Um, so it's, it seems like more likely the UV degradation will cause the plastic to weaken and then the plastic will just pop because it won't be able to take the pressure. But we're not really sure yet. Thanks. How much protection against the cold and other environmental factors up there does the hardware need? Um, this is a thing a lot of people kind of trip up on. I've seen so many times you get, you know, the kind of powder hand warmer things, little sachets, you put them in your gloves to keep your hand warm. People go, oh, it's very cold up there. My electronics will get cold. We'll put one of these in. Two problems. They need oxygen to work, which you don't have. And secondly, there's actually so little air that the electronics can't keep cool. Um, you don't get convection cooling, and the electronics are generating heat. So usually they end up quite warm by themselves just because they can't cool down. Um, so most people fly fairly exposed payloads, and it works just great. People will tell you that lipos don't work at minus 20, and maybe they're right, but it looks like they're not actually right. But they work just great. So... Um, how does the leakage, leakage rate change between uh, helium and hydrogen? So I'm not entirely qualified to answer. You'd think maybe, okay, hydrogen is a much smaller molecule than helium because it's only got one or two gubbins instead of four gubbins, but actually hydrogen exists as H2, so it's much bigger. So in fact, helium leaks much quicker. Basic is the short answer. Um, can you tell us a bit about the guy that's doing the round the world balloons? I mean, you said it only weighs 13 grams and you're comparing things with raspberry pies and things which are a lot heavier. Yep. Has he built it all himself or is he using something commercial or what? It um, sounds yep. incredible. So he's built it all himself. He's, I don't know, I think it would be fair to describe him as somewhat media shy. His website is a little sparse and um, he occasionally whines about people trying to talk to him on these other IRC channels. He's built all the electronics himself, which is a fairly normal thing to do, and he's worked on getting it as light as he reasonably can. So it's a very small PCB, it's got a few small surface mount components and nothing unnecessary. Um, he does this for his day job as well. He assembles like electronic systems and things for F1 cars and things. 
I don't know very many details about his real day job, but he knows his electronics inside out. So yeah, he's built it all himself. And pretty much he just came in, looked at what everyone else was doing and went, eh, this is nice, but... And well, the results speak for themselves, I suppose. Could you uh, tell us about the predictor software that you use? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, the predictor software is this great web tool. It's available online. You go to predict.hubhub.org, and you can type in where you're launching from, and it will show you where the balloon goes. And it does this by downloading a whole load of wind data for every point on the surface of the Earth for every time for the next two weeks, which is a heck of a lot of data. And it gets this from the American NOAA weather agency people who run a big supercomputer model to work out where the wind is blowing. And then it runs some clever integration methods to say your balloon is here and we know it's going to ascend at this ascent rate based on how much helium you've put in and so forth. And it will burst at this altitude because that's when the balloon gets so big it pops. And then it will descend at this rate, we hope, because that's how thick the atmosphere is and it's got this parachute, say. And uh, then it lands. And the software's kind of changed a lot about how people can do ballooning. It means you can launch and be confident you're avoiding airports and cities and jet fighters who are training. <laughs> that was really awkward. Um, <laughs> like, cutting down the tree was no problem, but the later CAA investigation was. Um, so it's a good tool. It gets used like 2,000 times a day by people all over the world. There's a really great photo that I probably can't show you um, of every place anyone's requested a launch from, and it's basically a population density map of the Earth. Anywhere there are people, we've got people requesting these predictions. And um, also the new version of the predictor, because rewriting everything from scratch is always the best idea is being deployed in a couple of weeks and it's even cleverer. You can do fancy things like say, I'm going to launch sometime in the next two weeks, show me where all the possible landing locations are. And I'm going to launch and I can change how much helium I can put in, how much should I put in to avoid going in the sea. So also it's in Python and like mad fast, it's faster than the C version. It's, it's fantastic, it's like two milliseconds per prediction. So it's cool. Um, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, what do you think about uh, Facebook and Google and their Wi-Fi balloons? Do you think that's realistic? Yeah, um, there was a UK Haas conference like two weeks ago and we had one of the guys who's consulting for Google Loon give us a talk about Google Loon. And it seems like it's working really well. They've actually had balloons stay up for like a couple months and they're launching, they've got launching down pat. We saw a video of them kicking off these balloons and it's like they just throw them out every hour or so and they mesh perfectly and they provide Wi-Fi. So it seems to be working great. Um, they claim they can control where the balloons go by making move up and down, which is entirely believable. Whether it becomes a feasible commercial project, I'm not sure, it seems really expensive, but the technology definitely all works. Um, could you tell us about some of the worst flights where things have either exploded or run into things or, or something like that? <laughs> um, some of them. <laughs> which ones? I, I quite like, there's a military base called RAF Fetford and um, we came down while they were doing some helicopter training of Chinooks and they were most displeased and it landed in this really tall tree and we were like, oh no, our thing's in the tall tree and this is the one where thought, oh yeah, we'll cut that down for you, no problem and got out like a huge chainsaw, cut into the tree, army jeep, pulled the thing over, no trouble and then set the CAA onto us. There's this in big investigation where they're like, you know, should we have done something differently? Are we liable? What would have happened if we hit a helicopter? Would that have been really bad? Answer, yes. And eventually they concluded that really we were probably doing everything legally and fine. And the guy running the investigation was like, also, this looks really cool. Can I see some of the photos you took? <laughs> so that was, that was a happy ending. Um, I, are there any other? I think the one that landed in central London after the last EMF was pretty bad. It actually landed in um, Pineham Park and um, some Richmond Park. And we knew someone who was out walking in Richmond Park that afternoon, so he picked it up for us, which was great. Um, I th the UK has one. I'm getting a, a, a shaking head. I probably shouldn't mention that one. There, there were children. <laughs> and make sure they're fairly soft and well padded and Nothing too bad. Oh, one happened to someone else. I can definitely talk about this. It landed on a power line and they had to shut down power to an entire village for an afternoon to get the thing off again, which was a huge chunk on a certain media company's insurance claim. Um, <laughs> that, wouldn't, that must have been really awful. Yeah, that. I think 
later one landed in the middle of a train track and like you suddenly understand why they put all those emergency numbers on the bridges like to phone the train companies and have them stop the trains. Any, any, any suggestions? Oh yeah, um, we had another fun one where we came down and it looked for a very long time like we'd land on a major motorway which would have been so awful. Turns out, fun fact, 1% of the surface, surface area of England is major roads, which means you launch 100 balloons, you expect one of them to land on a major road. Hasn't happened yet. This balloon was drifting straight over a major road, and it really, really looked like it would land on it and cause us no end of trouble. Then at the last moment, it veered off to the side and almost took out a construction worker on top of the building. The best part is the video cameras were still running, so we have this great video of it swinging by, not quite hitting him. And the guy goes, oi, what's this? Picks it up. We've written harmless scientific experiment on the side. He goes, harmless, mate? <laughs> 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 yeah, Less fortunately, he then proceeds to open up the box that doesn't contain the video cameras and rummaging around for freebies, as he calls it, he goes, ooh, batteries. Takes the batteries out, realises it's a GPS tracker, puts it back in the box. <laughs> still has not clued that the other box is a video tracker, so we've got this great video of him then carrying it to his boss, and he's like, what shall I do with this? And the boss is like, eh, eh, eh. And then they realise it's got a phone number, and they debate whether they should call us. They decide we're probably some stuck up and don't call us. And then we turn up at their office a few minutes later, and we're like, hi, could we have our balloon back, please? It's inside your office. <laughs> so um, I later edited that into a video compilation on YouTube where we blurred out the guys' faces, but you can hear all the audio, and it's quite good fun. So. I think that's probably enough bad launch stories. But like, maybe if you find me late at night in the bar, I can tell you the one about the children. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, I was curious about what you were saying before about um, uh, if everyone put their own balloons up and then you could share your connection with other people and, and connect to your, your home network on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on, on that a little bit? Sure. So the basic idea is this UKHAS.net is the thing that's been set up for it. And you run these radio modules, RFM 169B, they've got some part number. And um, they automatically form a kind of network where any one of them transmits, anyone else that hears it receives it. And we have a simple protocol that lets them repeat anything they hear. So they act as kind of repeater stations. There's a time to live in the packet, time to live, I suppose. So the packets only get repeated so many times, and then the balloons are just another node. And the idea is you have one in your garden that sends back logs temperature or humidity or something boring. And you have one in your house that's plugged into your computer over USB, and that's enough to get anything it receives sent up to the internet. And then the internet has a map and you can see everything any of them have received. And the really key idea is if a balloon goes overhead, it should have line of sight with your network on the ground and someone else's network on the ground and could relay packets between them. And likewise, if you had three or four balloons, they could all see each other and send packets between them. Um, it's not clear how useful it would be, but it would be really cool. And so people are pursuing it. And as I understand it, there are or will be several of these nodes around the site here. So and maybe we'll get the badges doing it as well, maybe. OK. Are we all questioned out? That's great, because it's now 14.46. So we are one minute over time. Thank you all very much.